Turn your Bible to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, we're going to start in verse 6. Um, got my, kind of dressed up a little bit warm today, got my hat on and things. Uh, it's sub-zero outside and uh, pretty windy and everything, so this place does not, you know, we don't heat the upstairs, so it gets pretty chilly up here. So I'm dressed up pretty warm, so. Uh, Psalm 103. I'm going to talk today about the law of sowing and reaping. It's going to be a very important study um, and very convicting. Psalm 103, verse 6. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust." As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth, passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Now, a lot of people will read that and they'll say, well, isn't that just so wonderful? We have such a loving God and, and uh, just how He's just always there. He's willing to forgive and just, and just He loves us so much. And they focus so much on the love. But they kind of forget who wrote this. It's written by David. We're going to come back to Psalm 103. But let's go back to 2 Samuel, the book of 2 Samuel. Chapter 12, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. If you find one of those books, you know, you're heading in the right direction. Second Samuel chapter 12. I'm going to read a story here about this great man, David, that was able to write such beautiful words about the Lord and how many comforting things in Psalm 23 and all the other beautiful psalms that are out there and, and things, and see what kind of a spiritual man this guy was. Second Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. He did it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was given and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him and took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. This is after David's sin, which we'll get into here. Verse 7, And Nathan said to David, Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast t uh, taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife." Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise, raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, 
and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst, didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, thy, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, get a hold of that one, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Wait a second. This is the same guy that wrote over there in Psalm about the Lord doesn't remember iniquities and, and his, his, you know, our iniquities are as far away as the east is from the west and, and he's righteous. and Uh-huh. It's the same guy. Wicked, disgusting thing that he did. And if you don't know the story, you can read back, you know, hearing the story and things. And, and he looks and he's up on the housetop and he looks and he sees a man's wife bathing and he looks at her and he says, hey, gets his servants. He says, go get her, bring her in. I'm going to sleep with her. Commits sexual sin, adultery. And then he finds out that she's with child, his child. And so what's he do? He doesn't get it right. He doesn't clean it up. He gets her husband killed in battle so that he can have her as his wife. And he thinks oh, he got away with it. All done in secret. Everything's just kind of, shh, you know, just like a lot of you think that you're getting away with sin. You mess around with things. If you haven't seen my study on the serious uh, or how Satan uses sexual sin to destroy a Christian, um, you might want to watch that. Um, this is kind of a part two to that. Um, because there's a thing there called the, the, the law of sowing and reaping. See, what David did when he saw this situation, he lusted after that woman and he sowed to his flesh. He gave in to his lust. You know what he should have done? He should have looked over and went, whoop, oh boy, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have even looked at that. There's an old saying, they say, well, it doesn't hurt to look. It doesn't hurt to look. You, you know, you see a pretty girl going down the street, you're, hey, look at that, you know. Uh, yeah, it does. Jesus Christ said, if you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already with her in your heart. All right. That doesn't mean that you're guilty of the same level of adultery as somebody that actually physically does the act. The Lord's just simply saying, you've already, by looking at with lust, you might as well just go on over and take care of it. All right. You've already sinned. You're already planning that, that time. You might not be able to get that woman, but if you're starting to look with lust at at women out there and you're married it's just one step like I said you might not get the one that you saw there that caused lust that you're lusting after but you might you're gonna get another one sometime all right so when you read about David writing all this nice beautiful stuff about the Lord and everything else you gotta remember this is from a guy that was punished by the Lord harshly punished by the Lord let's read about that Verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will, then, how will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? Paul's just there for a minute. Seven days? Can you imagine the agony of going through hearing your child crying? Seven days? And you're thinking to yourself, Lord, please. I mean, it isn't just, you know, the Lord just, boom, instant death or something. Seven days he's there, crying out to God, not eating anything, laying on the floor. Please, God, please don't kill my son. Please don't kill him. I, I'll do anything. I'll just, just bargaining with the Lord. Seven days. Oh, but God, God just is so merciful and loving. He just doesn't care about sexual sin at all, does he? Say, well, Brian, that's the Old Testament. Just wait. I'm going to show you it's New Testament doctrine as well. 
we got to remember, brethren, that we deal with a holy, righteous God. And He will be very, very harsh on sin to saved or lost. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I've seen Him let lost people get away with things because they're not His child. But the saved, when they start messing around with sin, and you can get to the point, you're going to heaven, but you're not going to have that fellowship restored. I'm going to tell you that. We're going to get into that in this study. That's the whole point of this study. Because a lot of you think, oh, it's not that bad. You know, okay, you know, whatever. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I can, you know, just, if I mess up, well, you know, it's bad. It's a lot worse than you think. God put David, you know, a great man. And yet he put him through just terrible, terrible times. Let's look at the, David's response here. Because this is important to get. Yes, there is a condemnation there against sin. If you mess up, it's really, really bad. And the Lord's going to punish you harshly. I've been punished very harshly in my life for some of the dumb things that I've done. Uh, I've sinned pretty stupid sins. And, you know, a lot less than most people if in, out there in the lost world. But you know what? I'm held to a very high standard. Uh, you get into ministry, God will hold you to a much higher standard. Um, you know, the Bible talks about be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Um, yeah, the Lord uh, doesn't let me get away with very much. And I thank Him for that, too, by the way. But uh, God will punish you sometimes. And the best thing that you can do in that time of punishment is just get as close as you can to the Lord. Run towards Him. We'll see that here with David. Verse 19, But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. That's what you're reading about over in Psalm 103. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he, set, and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jebediah because of the Lord. All right? So, notice a couple things here that's very important. David messed up really, really, really bad. God punished him with a horrible punishment. Just a torturous, terrible thing to do. And, and it didn't end there. Okay, David had all kinds of problems. You know, his one son, you know, tries to kill him. And there's insurrections and all this other stuff and things. Uh, David had a rough life because of that sin. And because of some of the other things he did that were wrong before God. There was a couple times God whipped him bad. All right. Um, I have to understand that too. But what does David do? He worships the Lord. In spite of all that stuff, he comes in and he says, God, and you'll get to this point as a Christian, as you mature, whatever I get, I deserve. I can't speak against the Lord and say, why'd you do that to me? I didn't deserve that. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I deserve a lot more. Uh, if God would have killed me years ago, um, I couldn't have said anything about it. I'd say, oh, yeah, okay. You know, um, I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad the Lord spared my life many, many times over. But notice the other thing that he did. In verse 24 and 25, he says, Okay, I messed up, but I'm going to take responsibility for my actions. He could have just said, Hey, Bathsheba, sorry, God's not for this thing and here and whatever else and stuff. I mean, he killed a guy's wife, and in the Old Testament, they were still allowed to have multiple wives and things. So he takes responsibility for his actions, and he says, Okay, she's going to be my wife now. I'm going to you know, she's going to, I'm going to take responsibility for this woman. Again, take responsibility for your actions. 
if you get messed up in something. Go back to Psalm 103. You see, a lot of people, they'll go through these verses and they don't ever get you in context. Who is it that's writing this? It's David. Well, David just lived this blessed, wonderful life and God just loved him in spite of anything that he's ever done. Uh-uh. That's not the case. God's love was there, but part of God's love is his justice and his wrath that comes upon those who do wrong. I say wrath, I should say his, his judgment, okay? Say it that way. Psalm 103, verse 6. We'll read these verses again. And now look at it from a different light. Because you know David is the one and David's gone through all this stuff. Psalm 103, verse 6. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Another thing, what should have really happened to David for the sin that he did? He should have been stoned to death. Old Testament law. He should have been put to death. Well, why didn't that happen? Well, because of verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. When you get punished, punished by the Lord and you know, hey, I did wrong and this is what happened and stuff, and the Lord punishes you. I remember early on when I first got saved and I still was struggling with pornography and things. I remember the one time I was out logging and I've told this story before and I, I was bucking this, this log. You know, you cut it into lengths it's called bucking. And I, I had my saw and I stepped backward. I looked back. I was in this. It was really, really rocky. These big boulders and everything. This tree, you know, guy had felt it down in. I was, you know, anyways, I stepped back and I was cutting it. I was going to say, I stepped back and I thought... It looked like ground behind me. I just kind of quick glanced back and I, I thought it was ground and it was just a bunch of leaves between two big rocks. Well, I put my foot there and I went, look, and it went, my foot went right down in this hole and I got this running chainsaw. So I take the saw like this and I tried to put my hand back to catch myself and I couldn't do it. And there was a pointed rock and I landed right on my back and it missed my spine by about that much. Bruised my pelvis and it was, it was so painful. It was ridiculous. And I went to the hospital. I thought maybe I hit my kidneys or something and, and I was going to have, you know, internal bleeding or I had no idea. They did took an x-ray and they said, oh, you, you know, bruised your pelvis really bad. But the uh, Lord spared me. He's merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Had the Lord paralyzed me, think about that. All of a sudden, I wouldn't have had any feeling below the waist. Would that have taken care of some of the lust issues and things like that? I don't know. But the Lord was merciful. He was gracious. And I couldn't say, God, why would you let that happen to me? I, I deserved it. And I knew I deserved it. Verse 9, He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Good, because when you ask the Lord for forgiveness, you know, and you want to restore that fellowship, he'll take you back. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. The wages of sin is death. Do you sin? How many times has the Lord spared your life? You earn death every time that you sin. And I'm not trying to say you can live sinlessly perfect, because you certainly can't. But the whole point is, you need to fight that. It's a daily battle, a daily struggle, war against the flesh. Verse 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, and so great is his mercy toward them that fear him, do you fear God? You know, I was walking through the grocery store today. We were, I had to do some shopping earlier. Walking through the store, and, and there was uh, um, some kind of thing, and, and uh, something about pigs, seasoning for pig roast or something like this. And it, um, and it showed this pig, and he's, and he's standing there. I just looked there, I was like, oh, pfft. This pig, and it's and it's the depiction of the, you know, the buttocks, excuse me, of the pig. And, and I'm just like, you know what? Whoever made that label like that and made a perverse thing on the back, joking about a private part of, of the body, and it was not a pig's, you know, bottom end. It was a person's that was connected to this pig thing. And I'm thinking, you know what? Whoever did that doesn't fear God. 
And there's an awful lot of stuff out there in this world. People just do it and they have no fear of God. You know, lost people 200 years ago had more fear of God than most Christians do today. You better fear God. So, well, I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ and my sins are all forgiven and my sins are all paid for. Yet, yeah, you're still supposed to fear God as a Christian today. Verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Absolutely true. Imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our sins are all paid for. Then why would you continue messing around? If Jesus had to die for the sins of your past before you got saved. Why do you want to keep doing those? Why do you want to keep doing the things that he suffered and bled and died for and was humiliated? Has there been a change in your life since you've gotten saved? You say, well, not, not a whole lot. Well, then you better, you better check and make sure that you did get saved. Better make sure that God saved you. So that's a whole issue. All this debate and stuff out there, all these people. Well, do you really have to repent? Is there really a changed life? Is there all this other stuff? A lot of times it's just lost people philosophizing about what they think salvation is. Continuing, verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. It doesn't say he pities you just, and you don't deserve it, okay? And, you know, you got to earn his pity. You earn his pity by fearing God, by having standards. The Bible says, be holy for I am holy. We're commanded to be holy. We're commanded to not be like the world, to not conform to the world. That's how you get his pity. If you fear God, you don't fear man. If you fear man, you don't fear God. It's just that simple. Verse 14, For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. He forms man out of the dust of the ground. Chemically speaking, you are dirt. <laughs> it's a thought to think about, isn't it? As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. There are different commandments for different dispensations. All right? And the Lord looks down and he says, I know that you struggle with your sin. I know. But there had better be that struggle there. Galatians chapter 5. Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Down through. The fruit of the Spirit. Lest those. The flesh lusteth, lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. They're contrary the one to the other. God better see the struggle. If there's no struggle there, it's the flesh that's winning. Don't even tell me that the flesh is going to give in to the Spirit and just let the Spirit win and just going to sit there and say, okay, I guess I won't fight. I'm, I'm beaten now and I just won't. That's not going to happen. They're contrary the one to the other. It doesn't say contrary for the first year or two after you get saved or after 10 years, you know, it'll kind of kick up a little. It's contrary all the time completely. And that's part of the change that happens after you get saved. All of a sudden, you realize the things that I used to just take for granted and I just did and I never felt any shame about, now I'm ashamed of these things. I've seen so many people, they get saved, they have foul mouth before salvation, they get saved and it's just like, whoop, it just changes. And all of a sudden, they'll, they'll let a, uh, some profanity out or something, they get mad or they hit their hand with a hammer or something and the cuss word comes out and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. And they get all shook up. It's part of the change there. Part of fearing God, you see. And the Lord, He's going to have mercy. He's going to have grace. All the things that we read about here, that's going to be there if He sees the struggle. If He sees, Lord, I'm just, I'm sorry. I just, you know. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1. Okay? He needs to see the struggle. If there is no struggle, the flesh is winning. It's as simple as that. See, that's the interesting thing about the Lord. You can, if you're you know, in that war and the flesh gets raised up above the spirit, the Lord's not going to start to vex the flesh with the spirit. He'll come in and he'll chase him. Sure. But the, Lord's, the Lord is not going to come in and force you to read the Bible or whatever else. 
He's not going to do that. Of the two, the, the spirit is going to take the back seat and just be quiet. Say, okay, you want to do that? You want to go over there and you want to watch that? You want to go over and say that thing? And you want to eat that and listen to that and wear that and whatever else you want? To, okay, go ahead. See? But you reverse it. If you're reading the Bible and you're, you're trying to witness to people when you can and you're getting out gospel tracts and you're listening to the right music and whatever else, the flesh is going to be fighting you every day. You'll be doing great. You go to the grocery store and all of a sudden hear some classic rock music or some other song that you used to listen to, you used to enjoy back when you were lost and your flesh is just in there going, dancing along to that thing and singing at the top of its lungs and your spirit's just going, oh man, I don't want to hear this. What, you know, what are we doing? In here? I don't, uh, and you just feel like running. So I've never felt that struggle. <laughs> Get saved and you will. Let's go to Job chapter 4. I'm going to show you a couple more scriptures here. And we're going to go to the New Testament. I'm going to show you the law of sowing and reaping in the New Testament for a Christian today. Because I know that there's some of the brethren. I am dispensational. I have always, well, I can't say have always been because I didn't understand really early on when I first got saved. But I've been a dispensational preacher now for a long time. And uh, praise the Lord, I've been able to lead quite a few other people to that position, to the rightly dividing position. Um, so I'm careful, you know, I go through the Old Testament, I hear some guy preaching on Old Testament, I say, well, okay, does it line up in the New Testament? All right? It's not that, you know, the non-dispensational lying devils out there, they'll say that dispensational Christians ignore the Old Testament. They say that's not for us, it's all just the Pauline epistles and some even less of the Pauline epistles. There's parts of the Pauline epistles that are not even for Christians. That's hyper-dispensationalism, by the way. Um, that isn't it. A dispensational believer reads the Old Testament and says, okay, now what goes from Old Testament to New Testament? What carries over? All right, that's an important distinction to get. Job chapter 4, verse 8. We'll see this thing of the law of sowing and reaping. Even as I have seen that they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. We're going to see that in the Pauline epistles. When you plow iniquity and sow wickedness, you will reap the same. Okay, that is a law of science. All right, there's never been one case where somebody has taken a seed, a tomato seed, and put it in the ground and they get, uh, you know, a palm tree or something like this out of it. That doesn't happen. A tomato seed will produce tomatoes, a tomato plant. A corn, grain of corn, will produce a corn plant. Whatever you plant in the ground will come up as, you know, the seed that was planted. It'll grow. Now, what's the lesson we can learn here? What did King David do? He looks over and he sees that guy's naked wife over there bathing, and he goes, oh, Bathsheba, oh, boy. Oh. Was it a shame for him to see that? No, it could have been by mistake. Up there, and you look over and you go, oh, oh, boy. Did you ever walk into a grocery store? Um, I thank the Lord that uh, the grocery stores here don't have pornography in them and, and things, but I've been to different states and they have, you know, porn magazines and stuff like this. And and there's been times, you know, you walk in and you're looking around and you hear somebody say something and you go like this and you look over and it's like, oh, you know, like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry about that. I, you know, I just, I did not see that. Or you go to click on some kind of a thing online or whatever else and it comes up and you, oh, and you quick shut the thing down. There's no sin in that. Okay, that was a mistake. The sin comes when you go, whoop, like that, and you look away and you go, nobody's looking. Let me just go on over here and take it off the shelf. And nobody's looking. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Sowing to the flesh. If a man looks on a woman with lust, he's committed adultery in his heart already with that woman. You see? He's already formulating the mindset to become an adulterer. That's what's going on there. If you sow, if you plow iniquity, sow wickedness, you will reap the same. Proverbs chapter 22.
Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. I thought that was rather interesting there. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. You know what's amazing? How many guys, you know, in their, in their youth and strong, muscular guys and muscular shirts and everything else, and they, you know, hey, baby, and stuff, and they got all the cool things and stuff, and they're just cheating and, you know, going around sleeping with this girl and sleeping with that and everything. What's it mean when they get old? Broken old man got, you know, how many children to different women and things like this, and just there, and, the, you know, most of the children don't want to come around and, and, you know, he's busted up so many marriages, he's there by himself in some cruddy little crappy apartment someplace. What did he do? Well, he sowed iniquity, and he reaped vanity. That's the amazing thing. Sin is never profitable. Let me say that again. Sin is never profitable. You know, I was talking with a sister, and uh, she was talking about uh, her husband, and he's into all fast cars and everything else and, and stuff. Uh, and you lust after these fast cars, and you covet these fast cars, and uh, you sow iniquity. Covetousness is iniquity, you know, and you go out as a lost man, and you're saying, I want that, and I want this, and everything else, and you get all these cars and everything else, and what is it? You reap vanity. What does it mean? You know? What, do you think you're going to get up to heaven someday, and before, you know, the Lord at the great white throne judgment, and the Lord's up there, and he goes... Well, your name's not in the book of life, but let me tell you, you had some really cool cars. I mean, I'm so impressed by that one. It did like 175 miles an hour or something. I mean, whoa, you know. <laughs> Vanity. Get down to, to hell and you're down there weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth between the times when you're talking about how fast your car went or how big your house was or how much money you had in your bank account or your fancy clothing or your fancy jewelry or whatever. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? doesn't mean anything. But people out there in the lost world, they constantly are sowing to themselves, sowing to their flesh. What do you want, flesh? You want that big screen TV? You want that new car? You want the money? You want the career? You want the beauty? You want the sex perversion? You want all that stuff? You know what it is? Vanity. Vanity. Nobody alive on this earth today can even come close to what King Solomon had. And yet, what's he say in Ecclesiastes? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's all vexation of spirit. Thousand women to choose from. Riches beyond your wildest dreams. Physical riches, too. I'm not talking about little digital currency or something like this on a computer. Physical riches. Everything that a man could possibly want. And he says, it's all vanity. It's interesting, too, because of who wrote this? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8. Solomon. Isn't that something? By thy words thou shalt be condemned, by thy words thou shalt be justified, the Bible talks about. Might have the order of that backwards. But the whole point is, he cut his own throat. I find that interesting. But now let's go to the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6. Say, so we've been in the Old Testament an awful lot. Well, yeah. Things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So I think that might have been written to a lost man. Nope, sorry. Lost people there cannot sow to the Spirit. Shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's for saved people. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It's talking about a saved person. 
Only imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Oh, I understand. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth, cleanseth us from all sin. I understand that. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. I understand. I understand. I understand. But you know what? If you sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. It is a law of science. It is a, it is a law of this universe. What you sow, you reap. You say, well, uh, you know, that, that, does this start after salvation? Oh, well, I'm going to tell you right now, it starts before salvation. It starts the day of your birth. You see, God gives you a conscience. And you have to sear that conscience to do certain things in this life. You say, well, I was raised as an atheist and we didn't really know about God. Yeah, but you know what? In your early days, you knew that certain things were wrong. I knew that certain things were wrong. Don't kid me. I knew of certain kids out there that had no Christian upbringing, and yet they had some decent morals, decent moral convictions. And, you know, people get deceived in that, and they say, well, I'm not such a bad person. I have decent moral convictions, so, you know, God wouldn't judge me. So, God will judge you based on what you could know and what you choose to look away from, all right? So there's no escape in that whole thing. But here's my point, all right? It's a very important point to get. What you decide to do in your life is going to affect you for the rest of your life, even if you get saved. Now, your sins are paid for. They're taken care of. You're going to go to heaven when you die. But let me tell you something. If you get a tattoo as a lost person, it's not going to disappear when you get saved. If you have children out of wedlock, they don't all of a sudden you get saved as a man and poof, there's a godly wife right there. And your children go, oh, it's our mother. You know, it doesn't work that way. If you're a single woman and you have a child, you're still going to be a single woman with a child after salvation. You see? What you do with your life will affect you for the rest of your life. Now, as a Christian, God can come in there and he can start to help, you know, clean up your mess of a life that you've made. You know, I'll give you another good one. You drink like crazy as an alcoholic and then you get saved. And a couple years later, you have cirrhosis of the liver and you go, what in the world? Well, you drank for 30, 40, 50 years. What do you think is going to happen to you? You smoke for all that time. What do you think is going to happen to you? So, Brother Brian, this is kind of rough. Yeah, but you know what? Let's go back to David. David messed up and messed up and messed up and messed up. What do you do? Worship God. Run to the Lord. Fall at his feet. God, I know I deserve to be punished here. I know punishment is coming, but please, could you have some mercy? I know I deserve it. I know I deserve whatever I get, but God, please just don't hit me too hard. See, the standards that people used to have in the past where women dressed modestly and there wasn't all the sex perversion and stuff like this. I mean, secular people, okay? Uh, Richard Francis Burton, um, uh, he was an explorer. He was uh, with the uh, Royal Geographic Society in England, and he was an explorer in Africa and things like this. I've studied a lot of the guys from that time period, a lot of these explorers like David Livingston and Richard Francis Burton was another one. He was the guy that wrote the Kama Sutra, or translated, I should say, translated the Kama Sutra, the Kama Shastra, the pa perfume guard, sex manuals, okay? And at the time that he brought them out, 19th century England, he had to write them in Latin, because if he'd have written them in English for the common man to get a hold of, he'd have gone to prison for that. Writings, not illustrated, not pornographic, X-rated movies. Or writings, he would have gone to prison. That's a blessing, brethren. It's a blessing to have that kind of morality out there in society. Now with the modern thing, I just we you know said earlier we'd gone to the store today and I saw this pickup truck right downtown of Holton, you know, backwoods, you know, we're not Los Angeles or New York City or anything. There's this truck and it says, once forbidden, big letters about this, that big, once forbidden. And it was like Jack and Sly or something like this, like in a hearts or something, two guys, a bunch of sodomite perverts. It's once forbidden, but now look at us. Yeah, look at you. And you know what? They could get saved. But you know something? They're going to struggle for the rest of their life 
with whatever they're doing right now. They are sowing to the flesh and they will reap corruption. Oh, I got saved. I got saved. These guys down there got saved and stuff. Their, their, their uh, marriage broke up or whatever, you know. Okay, but uh, Sly got a sexually transmitted disease. He's got AIDS from his uh, partner there. Doesn't magically go away when you get saved. Your sins are paid for and you get to go to heaven when you die. But you know what? You're going to be dead soon because of those AIDS. And it's even worse for a Christian, by the way, the Christian that gets saved and then messes around after their salvation. If we read back and, you know, if you remember back what was going on with uh, David back there in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, what's it saying? Because you've done this thing and brought great sin and reproach upon, you know, Israel and upon the Lord, the lost people are looking at it and going, you know, look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The man who has his father's wife, and there's, he's there and fornicating and stuff, and it says, it is reported commonly among you. Who's doing the reporting? The lost world. And you think the Lord's just going to go, oh, I'm so upset about that. <laughs> Some kind of effeminate little says, uh-uh. Oh, yeah. No, you got a punishment coming. Remember my dad used to always say, he used to say, you mess around with the sin and stuff like that, God's going to take you to the woodshed old time thing you go out to the woodshed that's where the switches are the sticks and you get you get a whipping yep God's going to take you to the woodshed why uh, well because you're sowing to the flesh you're going to reap corruption yes your sin does matter Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Praise Lord. No condemnation. Keep reading. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're walking after the Spirit, and, you, and the Lord sees that, and like I said, you're walking after the Spirit, there's going to be that war between the Spirit and the flesh. If there is no war there, then the flesh is in control. I'll just tell you that. And if the Lord sees that struggle there, you read about in Romans chapter 7, the, the, just go up to verse 17 and down to verse 25, you'll see Paul talking about that struggle that he has. And there's that struggle. God's going to have grace there in that situation. He's going to do like he did with David. And he's going to look and say, he remembers that all flesh is grass. It's like dust. It's just here again or here and gone. You know, the Lord's going to see that and he's going to say, hey, they're really trying. They're really doing their best. You know, again, I see that with my own son, raising my own son, and sometimes I see him. He tries to do his best. I'm gonna have best. I'm gonna I'm gonna have grace for him. Hey, son, pick that thing up, and he'll go to pick it up, and he won't grab the right, or he won't do this or that. I'm gonna have some grace. But when I say pick that thing up, and he just stubbornly looks at me and disobeys, and he walks off and tries to do something else, he's gonna get in trouble. It's a reminder of myself with the Lord. The Lord says, Hey, Brian, pick that up. Don't touch that. Don't look at that. If he sees me trying, well, there's no, there's therefore now no condemnation. I'm not walking after the flesh. I'm trying to walk after the Spirit. I'm trying to do right. It's a struggle. But a lot of Christians get into this thing of saying, well, we're all sinners. We all struggle with sin and things like that, so don't beat yourself up about it. Oh, you better beat yourself up about it. You better learn to be very harsh on yourself. Your biggest, most harshest critic should be you. I can hide certain sins from you people. You can hide certain sins from me. I've had that thing happen so many times. People write me and stuff like that and meet me and things and whatever else, and they hide stuff. They keep things secret and hidden. And that's fine. I mean, between you and the Lord, that's not what I'm trying to say. But the whole thing is, you can appear to be very righteous to me. But inwardly, you got some real skeletons in the closet, as they say. You can't hide from God, though. Verse 2. 
For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Eternal salvation, that's true. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. All right, just stop right there. What the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. There's a system there, all right, and people were abusing it in the time of Jesus. Right? If you do certain sins, you can just kind of go to the priest, you put, you do the sacrifice commanded by Moses, and you go on back, and you can do the same thing over and come back and do the sacrifice and whatever else. Just to, kind of like the Catholic thing of, of penance and things like this. You know, well, you know, just kind of go into the priest, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. He says, what'd you do? Well, I did such and such. Okay, go on out and put 50 bucks in the offering plate and, you know, come in and, you know, vacuum the floor next week or something, and you're okay, you know. <laughs> same thing. Continuing here, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Comparing that to Galatians chapter 6. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death? Huh? You mean it's kind of a little threat there. Mm -hmm. We're going to see it as we continue. Because, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, when the flesh is in control, you're in the flesh. You can't please God like that. Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know, you hear these charismatic nuts, you know, Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, you know, let's get the Holy Spirit and come on down and stuff. Uh, he should be there already. In you. I mean, you've got to call him, you've got to summon him or something like this. <laughs> Crazy. Verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Talking to saved people. You will be condemned as a saved person, if you're living after the flesh. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Mortify? <laughs> what? Mortify? That sounds like such, just kind of like a medieval torture thing. Mortify. Instruction for you as a Christian. Today. Old Testament. No, 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 no. Today. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. See, the whole thing is the Catholics, they try very desperately to try to mortify their bodies. They'll go and they, they crawl on their knees and stuff up to, to worship some little statue or something like this or some relic, you know, this broken piece that was actually a real piece of the cross or something. And, you know, or I remember I was down in Costa Rica the one time and uh, there was this whole huge Catholic cathedral built over top of this little spring where this girl had come and there she found this little Mary appeared to her and she, and she gave her this little doll and so they literally, they had the shrine to the, you know, doll of Mary or whatever it was. And it's huge, elaborate cathedral, and it's got marble floors and these gigantic statues of saints, you know, that are like 12 foot high and things. And, I mean, the whole thing. And there's, you know, the hard marble floor going up to this huge, big golden altar and things. Just all kinds of money in the place. And these people are, are you know, got their rosary and they're just doing the beads and they're crawling up on their knees and stuff. What are they trying to do? Mortifying their body. They're trying to put down the flesh. But you see, the difference is there, they're not doing it through the Spirit. They take, uh, over the Philippines, they take these, these guys and they flagellate themselves, they whip themselves, and their, and their backs are just bloody and running down, blood all over them and stuff like this, mortifying themselves, but they're not doing the Spirit. You see? You can go out there and you can do all kinds of work and things for the Lord in your mind. 
but you're not striving lawfully. You're not doing what the Bible tells you to do. You're doing what appeals to your flesh. Well, we had a Christian concert and we played, you know, the latest CCM music and things like this, and it was really good and had a lot of people get saved. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You were serving the flesh. It has to be by the Spirit. And there's going to be war there. I mean, again, I come from the modern CCM movement. I come from, I was a modern Christian for 25 years of my life. There was no war. There was no fighting. There was no anything there between my spirit and my flesh. I was just enjoying life and I'm just getting along with the world and the world loved me and I loved the world and everything was just fine and dandy. There was no struggle. It wasn't there. But boy, when I got saved, <laughs> the Lord did some things in my life. And all of a sudden, uh, people that liked me before started to hate my guts. And uh, things changed quite a bit. And my desires and the things that I would watch and everything else, it changed. And now the things that I once had no problem with, now I was ashamed of. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's okay because I'm saved now. I'm eternally secure so I can do whatever I feel like doing. And God's just cool with it because He's removed my sins as far as the east is from the west. No, it doesn't work that way. You say, well, uh, then why did David write those things, Brian? Well, as I've been stating, uh, he wrote those things because of his sin, because he messed up. And he runs to the Lord and he grabs on to the Lord and he says, I know I'm going to get hit for this, but uh, please just be as gentle as possible. And I'm not going to say, don't do it. Why are you doing this? This isn't fair. He's going to say, I deserve it. Um, the times that I've been hit hard since I've been a Christian, the times the Lord has chastened me and rebuked me harshly, uh, I deserved it. And I've had to take responsibility for a lot of those actions. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. This is becoming a very important thing. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, I'm using this as instruction in righteousness, brethren. You can get into the doctrinal stuff there as First Peter for us. Is he writing to... We're not going to get into all that stuff. Instruction in righteousness. If the righteous scarcely be saved. <laughs> Do you ever realize how big of a sinner you are after you've been saved? You didn't mind in the past, did you? You know, I had my little convictions as a professing Christian and stuff like that. And, and I knew certain things were wrong and I shouldn't be. But boy, when, that, when you actually get born again and the Lord saves you, not your own just little imagination, proclamation of imagination or something. The Lord saves you and all of a sudden you see that huge glaring difference between your flesh and the spirit and you're going, oh wow, you know. You realize, I'm scarcely saved, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm very wicked. I mean, the blood of Jesus Christ washed my sins away, praise God and, and everything else. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can fall out of salvation or lose it. or whatever. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is you really, truly, for the first time, get to look at yourself in the mirror and realize just how bad you really are and just how wicked you are and how prone to sin you are. And it's at that point in time that you have to start looking and saying, I need to grow some things for the Lord. I want to grow as a Christian. So I guess maybe I ought to start to sow to the Spirit and not to my flesh. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. The longer it goes, the more the uh, crop starts to kind of get, it starts to dwindle. The Lord will let you get away with some things early on in your salvation that as the process of sanctification happens, He's going to say, hey, uh, don't, don't plant that anymore. 
well, Lord, I was just going to watch this documentary. I mean, it's secular and things like that, but I was just going to watch this thing here. And the Lord says, yeah, but it's got evolution in it. It's got feministic agenda. It's got, you know, two or three words of profanity. He said, well, that doesn't sound that. The Lord says, don't watch that. I don't want you to watch that. You go to the store and you see that junk food and things there and you go, oh boy, I sure love these growing up. And the Lord says, don't touch that. But Lord, I've been eating this stuff all my life. What, huh? The Lord says, pick it up, look at it. You look at the ingredients. No, oh, natural flavors. E ugh. High fructose corn syrup. All this other stuff, Lord says, uh, can you serve me efficiently with that junk in your system? He said, no, brother Brian. I come can you serve the Lord efficiently when you have a lot of junk food in your system? No, you can't. I mean, <laughs> that's a rough one for me. I go to the store and it's just like, oh, and my wife is like, no, we're not getting that. Why? Well, look at the ingredients. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, maybe just one or something. No, <laughs> you know, she helps me with that. You know, uh, it gets rough. I just, you know, maybe I'll just go and listen to this or maybe I'll just go and look at that real quick. You know what you're doing when you do that? You're sowing to the flesh. And when you sow to the flesh, you are guaranteed it's going to reap corruption. You say, well, maybe not this time. Uh, no, if you sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. The law of sowing and reaping, it always will happen that way. There is not one good thing that can come of you eating junk food. Not one thing. So it makes me feel good. It makes your flesh feel good. There's not one good thing that can come from you listening to the wrong kind of music. It makes your flesh feel good. Oh, well, I, you know, I did look at some dirty stuff the other day, but I repented and I got over that and everything else. And Uh-huh. You know what you're doing? Every time you look at dirty pictures, you're defiling your mind more and more and more, and you're becoming more and more perverted. Pervert is twisting. It's changing that pure mind that you have. Every time that you pervert it, it's twisting it and changing it. How many of you out there wish that you could say, that you had a pure mind and only knew one other person, sexually speaking, and that's your husband or your wife compared, you know, to what in, in other words, in whatever you were, man, you know, you have your wife or woman, you have your husband. Wouldn't it be nice to say I've never seen anybody else naked? I've never known what sex was, what it, what it looked like or whatever until our night of our honeymoon. After we got married, consummated the marriage. Wouldn't it be nice? But how many people can say that? What'd you do? Uh, so did the flesh. Now you're reaping corruption. So, well, brother, I got saved. Bless God, I'm saved. I don't have to reap the corruption. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. The decisions that you make, I mean, God's there the whole time, brethren. The whole time, God's there. And you can't tell me that there were times that you didn't turn against God as a lost person before you got saved. I don't know too many people that, that the very first time that they heard the gospel or the very first time that they even heard the name of God or the name of Jesus or whatever else that they just instantly were just like, I got to get saved. Most people at some point in time said, you know what, don't talk to me about that. I don't want that. And you had to get to a point where you were finally broken and said, okay, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry I've rejected you in the past. I need to get saved. Please save me. The Lord will save you. Sure. But you know what? How much sowing to the flesh did you do? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to run to the Lord? Are you going to fall down on His feet and say, God, thank you for giving me what I don't deserve, for saving me and for giving me life yet? I'm still breathing. You still give me an opportunity that I can work for you. I still have a chance. I sure messed up back then. I'm not going to dwell on that, Lord. Did you see David? You know, he washes himself. He goes in and worships the Lord. He's getting something to eat and things. He isn't sitting there going, you know, eating his food and all of a sudden. Oh, just the thought of my son dying. And I, oh, you know. No. 
He washes his face, washes himself, and he says, I'm not going to be able to go. He's not going to come to me, but I'm going to go to him someday. I'm going to see my little boy again someday. All right, Lord. I deserve that. Sorry about that, Lord. What do you want me to do? Get busy. Get active for the Lord. That's the best thing that you can do. You say, well, I've lived a real wicked life, Brian, and, and uh, God saved me later on in life and things, and I'm sure suffering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen people, they get saved in, in, at the end of their life, at the end of the whole way in the end of their life, and they just lived just terrible that whole time. Now they're older and they got health problems and lung cancer and this and finances and marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce and children problems and, you know, they don't want to talk to them and they're fighting. And I've seen some people make a mess of their lives. And they get saved. Praise God. They're going to heaven when they die. Praise the Lord. But boy, what a mess. What a wreckage. If you're a young person, I know there's a lot of teenagers that watch these videos, and I praise the Lord for that. Uh, I really wish I would have watched some of this type of stuff when I was a teenager. Of course, they didn't have YouTube when I was a teenager. We didn't even have electric back then. We used stone chisels. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm not that old. But, uh, you know... <laughs> uh, you know, if you're a teenager, get this stuff figured out early on in life and say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with pornography. I'm going to stay pure until I get married. I'm not going to mess around. I'm not going to dabble in sexual things and stuff. And oops, I got burned. Oops, sorry. Don't sow to the flesh and you won't have to reap corruption later on down the road. Don't do it. Stay away from it. Well, people are going to make fun of you. Good, let them make fun of you. You know, I remember a story. I'll close with this. Uh, J. Frank Norris, when he was a little boy, Christmas time came around and all the tid kids in the town, uh, they get down and there was this like town little Christmas party thing. And, and uh, he told a story about that uh, he went down and his parents were poor. And um, this Santa Claus came in and stuff like this. And I'm not promoting Santa Claus. I'm just telling the story of what happened. And he said this Santa Claus, you know, somebody from the community dressed up like Santa Claus, and they were giving presents to the different children. And uh, they came up to J. Frank Norris, and they had this thing wrapped in cardboard. It looked like a book. And this handed it to him, and all these children are opening up their packages, you know, and stuff, and there's all these elaborate toys and everything else. And uh, J. Frank Norris opened up his package. It was a King James Bible. But his dad and mom got him. And all the children laughed at him. They all made fun of him. And one boy in particular is a rich boy. And he laughed and laughed and laughed and mocked J. Frank Norris. And J. Frank Norris broke down and cried, ran out of the building. He was so humiliated. He was so embarrassed. You know? But he kept that King James Bible and he read that King James Bible. And J. Frank Norris had his issues and things like that, but I think he was a saved man. And, uh, and he grew up to preach that Bible and teach that Bible and uh, became a great man. And um, one day he was walking down the road and, and uh, walking with somebody else and, and he sees this old bum many, many, many years later. And he sees this old bum all over along the street and he says to this guy walking with him, he says, who's that? The poor old, poor old guy over there is just a run down old bum. And the guy said, whatever the name was, and J. Frank Norris just stopped dead in his tracks and he said, that's that rich boy that made fun of me way back when. You see, J. Frank Norris, as a little boy, his parents gave him a seed, a precious seed, this book, and he planted it, and he sowed it into his mind, and he let this book guide him didn't matter what other people said. Didn't matter. They laughed at him. They mocked him. I got a precious gift here. But the other boy there, he uh, so did the flesh. I want a bigger present. I want better things. I want to be impressed. I want the world to be impressed by me. He so did the flesh. And he reaped corruption. And how many people out there, they sow to the flesh with their life and they do whatever they want. And they get to the end of the life and they, they realize that 
it's all been vanity. What a waste of time. And they die and they go to hell. And then what's it mean? Not a thing. So the purpose of this sermon is twofold. First, to anybody. Um, whatever you do in life has consequences. The wages of sin is death. And that's for lost people and saved people as well. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. So uh, be careful what you're sowing. Um, the second part of it is, if you have sowed a life of corruption and you're starting to reap some of the benefits of that, some of the uh, rewards, so to speak, negatively speaking, if you're reaping, you better run to Jesus Christ. You say, well, Brother Brown, I already did. I got saved. Now, I'm saying you need to run to Jesus Christ as far as I know I deserve this punishment. Please have mercy on me, God. The Lord punishes you. He takes away something. He takes away your health or takes away whatever else. You say, thank you, Lord. I deserve that. I'm still breathing. I'm still here on the earth. I still have a chance to earn, lay up treasures in heaven. Thank you, Lord. I deserve that. If I ever lose my wife, my son, my health, everything I own, it's going to be tough. But I need to say, I deserve it, God. I can't speak against the Lord. I can't say, why would you do such a thing to me? So that's going to be it for this study. I really feel, um, I had a brother write and say that, uh, you know, we need to refine the church. And uh, if judgment begins, it must first begin at the house of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And uh, I don't mean the house of God. Let's refine a church building someplace, you know, whatever else. My word, no. <laughs> you know, give it a new coat of paint, new carpet. and, and pff, No, <laughs> that's nonsense. Uh, let's talk about the body of Christ. And... Um, I've never been one to, to back away from controversial preaching. Uh, but I really think I need to kind of take it to the next level. And I, I need prayer for that. Uh, because my flesh resists that. Um, and it's not about, well, I'm afraid I'm going to lose support or whatever else or whatever. Um, the biggest reason my flesh resists hard preaching is because I know I'm going to be that much more accountable. If I preach to you that you need to stop sowing to the flesh, and yet I'm sowing to my flesh, I'm doing things that I know are wrong, I'm going to receive the greater condemnation for that. God's going to be rough on me. And God has been very rough on me. And I look at that and I say, thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. It's a refining process. You know, when God, or when you... Uh, when uh, somebody in, in uh, the metal industry, when they want to refine gold, you know what they do? They turn up the heat. They don't say, well, let's just kind of take it easy on it. So, you know, turn that heat up. We need to get more of that dross off the top. We need to burn that gold and get it hotter and hotter and hotter until that those impurities rise to the surface. We all need to judge ourselves, brethren. We all need to get to that point where we can be very self-judging and where we can, let's get, I mean, let's get a good, good war going on here between our flesh and our spirit and just simply say, you go to the store and, you, and, this, and this flesh says, let's get some of that. No, don't even look at it. Hey, look, there's a scantily clad woman walking. Nope, sorry, I'm not even going to look at it. Well, she's coming over to help you. Ignore her. You know, I knew a brother the one time, James Lyman, street preacher. And he'd be walking through a store. This one time, a buddy of his, which I knew, uh, Marty Harwood, both street preachers and stuff, and, and they're walking through this store, and he says, there's this filthy-looking woman come walking. And James Lyman walks right up to her, and he says, you're dressed like a whore, put some clothes on, and just keeps on walking. <laughs> and this woman's just, oh, oh, you know, kind of rough, <laughs> you know. But it's the right attitude. Another story I heard about him, he'd go to the, you know, where the dirty magazines and stuff were, and he'd take them all out, 
put them in a shopping cart and walk up to the customer service and say, this stuff is in sight of where my children can see it. I don't want it there. I want you to hide this stuff. Get it out of here. I'm not shopping at your store. Make a problem. They say, we're going to call the police. Call them. Be an interesting witnessing opportunity. <laughs> I mean, Christians need to be stronger in our convictions. I'm not saying you got to do, I mean, that's like ultra radical stuff, sure. But uh, be open to that. The Lord leads you to do something like that. I need to be open to that. So again, you know, putting myself into a situation now where I got to put my money where my mouth is. But let's raise the standard. You say, well, bro but Brother Brian, that things are getting worse and worse. Okay, then let's get better and better. Why do we have to say the, the church is on a downward slide, so let's just kind of just sit there and go along with it? No, let's, let's go the other way. As we see the rapture approaching, as we see it's just about over, let's get stronger in our convictions. Let's raise the standards higher for Bible-believing Christians. So please pray for me. Uh, thank you to everybody that is praying, because I can feel it. Um, you know, I went through a, a time there where it was time of testing and things and, and uh, really kind of having a hard time with sermon ideas and getting sermon notes done and things and, and my preaching was not where it should have been because it was just it was going through some, some trials. And uh, I thank the Lord that, that things have really turned around and, and um, got some things cleaned up in my life and had to admit to some pride issues and things I was doing wrong and, and um, I thank the Lord. For that refining, turning the heat up in my life and getting the impurities out. And right now, I'm 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 just like Lord, what is it? What's next? What's next? What what is there something else there, Lord? Um, I want it refined. I, I want to be refined. I want to get this stuff out of my life. I want to raise the standard. And now it's like there's so many sermon ideas I have now. It's just like it just comes into my mind so quickly, and and uh, you know I sit down and and start to just getting the thing done and um, I got all kinds of ideas good stuff to come out with I <laughs> uh, just need the conviction to be able to preach some of it to have it come out and make sense so uh, your prayers do mean a lot to us and uh, we pray for a lot of you as well but going to be it for this study uh, see what comes out in the future um so I guess we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much to everybody out there for your challenging comments and your prayers. And uh, I guess that's going to be it. So see you in the next study.